Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another of our CAE seminars. This one is in person versus hybrid, but uh, in principle, it's virtual. It is my great pleasure to have uh, Professor Andres Verzen with us. Uh, he has his MS and PhD from uh, Silesian University of Technology and the Helsinki University of Technology. Uh, after that, he was at Alto University as an associate professor leading the Concrete Technology Research Group. Then he was appointed full professor at Lulia University of Technology and the chair of the Structural Engineering Research Group. Since 2029, he's a chair professor of the Building Materials Research Group at the same university. Uh, he has more than 20 years of experience on nanotechnology, nanomaterials, alternative ecological cementitious binders, high strength, UHPC, durability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's very active as both editor and reviewer for several international building materials journals. And he has been a visiting professor at several universities in Europe, Canada, and Australia. So thank you very much, Professor Swazen. All yours. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I had the pleasure to see your laboratory and meet a couple of people. It's very, very good. And I think we we have a quite uh, interesting future with uh, several subjects we can cooperate and uh, so the, the topic of my presentation is nanotechnology as a tool to enhance sustainability of concrete so basically what i'm going to do i will tell you what we had what you have done what what my group have, has done over the last 15 years in the in the field and the, how it can be applied to sustainability uh, but first uh, first uh, just a few words about uh, from where i'm coming so uh, this is, uh, this is the Arctic Circle, and the uh, Lulio is just 60 miles to the south from it. So it's quite extremely, it's, it's, it's a very different environment compared to what you have here. There's still snow and the sea is frozen, and the winter is pretty much five to six months a year, in a year, and there is just sort of summer and spring. Uh, the university is, uh, is also quite small, but uh, at a quite good level. We are, we are focusing a lot on, uh, on the mining industry, so we do quite a lot of building material research focusing on the application in mining, in the mining shafts and this sort of things, but also also just uh, the sustainability is one of the topics which is, which is leading like everywhere else. Um, my group is, uh, is looking like this. So uh, we have a couple of professors, a uh, couple of PhD students, and uh, the, the, the feature of our group is that we are very international. We have people from all over Europe, actually all over, all over the world. Nobody from the US at the moment, it's my change. And uh, the topics, so the, the core of, of our activities is sustainability. And in this case, we are focusing on sustainability of materials, especially concrete, of course. There are just a couple of examples of projects we have, we have at the moment, but uh, there's many more coming. So just, just going around, so of course, the 3D printing of concrete, it's a subject which is, uh, which is very hot at the moment, but in our case, we focus purely on materials. We don't have a 3D printer. And uh, then you also were in the area of uh, geopolymer concrete. Uh, so we're trying to replace the Portland cement completely with some waste materials activated with uh, strong alkalis. We have also self-heating. Uh, we look quite a lot on this eco ecological concrete, so concrete which are based on uh, non-Portland cement binders or mix of Portland cements and SCMs and other materials. And look, how do they behave, for example, in fire? There has been a big question but if, but, uh, for example, a blasphemous stack concrete are performing well in fire or not, and the some results indicate that they are actually they can be a, they can be in troublemakers, troublemakers, and uh, especially when it come when it comes to tunnels and uh, this sort of things. And uh, uh, one of the interesting projects is this one, this clay uh, So in, in in here we use the mechanochemical activation to activate natural clay, and as a result we produce the strongly put surrounding material, which can replace 50, 60 percent of Portland cement. And the, the good thing about this process is then you don't have to apply the high temperature. And I have just learned and here in the laboratory you also do uh, this sort of research. So we have a quite good overlap. Um, yeah, so this is very, very short about my group, but uh, uh, just so you have some ideas what we are doing. Uh, coming back to the, to the topic. So uh, sustainability of concrete. So this, this is the, the one of these hot topics, which is uh, which is getting stronger and stronger. Everybody, everybody is doing something about sustainability, and everybody knows probably that the sustainability is affected by many by many factors. And of course, the structural and architectural designs are very important. The concrete mix design is another factor. Material selection. You cannot take any materials to 
and be and produce very sustainable concrete, you have to really be careful what you choose. Uh, then the other area is also execution of construction process. So you might have a perfect design, you can, might have a perfect material choices, but uh, you perform your casting operation in a wrong way and uh, you can induce some durability problems and those can of course shorten your lifespan and this is at the end lowering your sustainability. Then there's maintenance, so how well you maintain. But the, the topic which, I, which is uh, sort of quite important for, for this my presentation is monitoring. So uh, let's just see if I can. So I'm always trying to compare concrete structures to a human body. And uh, if you think uh, quite often you get some, some, uh, some signals from your body that something is wrong. And it can be just really tiny signal coming somewhere from inside. And you can get this signal years before deterioration of your body is so extensive that nothing can be done. So if you are, if you are wise enough, you can take this uh, warning from your body, go to the doctor and uh, stop the deterioration process much very, very early. So it means you, you won't have to go to the hospital even not taking any treatment. So the same thing uh, is, is with concrete. The, the, the problem is that at the moment, many of these monitoring uh, systems which are used, they give the information about the damage which already occurred. Quite often it's, uh, for example, the newest trend is to use drone to scan the concrete structures, look for crack formation. Once you have a crack, the, the process is already really advanced. So there's not much you can do behind besides trying to, to heal the crack or try to eject it with some materials, but this is way too, way too late. So, so our idea for, for the nanotechnology was to try to develop the system which would give you this very, very early, early warning from inside of a concrete structure before anything is visible on the outside. And uh, as you will see, this can be done quite, quite efficiently. Uh, these are these couple of topics I will, I will uh, I will go fast through it today. There's not much time, so I'll be really, really fast, I think. So first, just a few words about nanotechnology, nanomaterials, and how we can incorporate these nanomaterials into concrete. Uh, then we go for structural health monitoring, self-healing of concrete, just one slide, something about energy harvesting and mechanical properties of concrete and durability. And at the end, this is a very interesting topic, is the advantages at risk related to use of nanomaterials. This topic is quite often neglected if you, if you go for lectures or, or you look at some research papers or even books, this is quite often neglected just because it's, uh, there are lots of open questions and uh, the producers of nanomaterials don't wanna you know, make you feel, feel that you are in, in risk when you are doing something with nanomaterials, but uh, it's not as bad as it could be. It's actually there are positive signs as well. So the nanomaterials, so, you could say that any nanomaterial having dimension between one to 150 nanometers can be used as a classified as a nanomaterial. The, the, the problem is uh, not, many, 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 not very many people talk about this, is that, that the nano size can trigger, can trigger many things. So first of all, you can get excellent properties, mechanical properties or physical properties can be, uh, can be outstanding, something, nothing, something which was never seen before. But at the same time, you can induce hazardous properties into your nanomat in the internal material. So if you have a, let's say, substance, substance which is in its uh, micro size, it can be completely neutral for the humans. But once you uh, make this uh, material as a nano size, so you, you make it much smaller, it starts to be so highly reactive, then it can be really harmful for the human, human body. And there are very many examples of, of, of this sort of reactions. So one has to be really careful dealing with those those nanomaterials. On the right side, you can see the example of, uh, uh, so inside there is a Portland cement and on the outside you see these are carbon nanofibers. How it was done, I will, I will tell you later. Uh, the material. So the, where these nanomaterials are, of course they are on a, on a very left end of the, of, the, of the scale. Here is the virus, it's around one micrometer. So you can see that COVID is somewhere here. So our nanomaterials, is, they are much, 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 much smaller than even the COVID, which, uh, which is also a good indicator about the protection, hu protecting human against those. Because if, if, if you imagine now, everybody's recommending the face mask to wear, and there has been lots of discussion whether the face mask help or not, because the, 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 the virus is so small, can go through it. So what if you talk about the, instead of one micrometer, when you talk about 10 or 20 nanometers, how can you protect people from it? If you have a nanomaterials, let's say in concrete, concrete gets broken or it's wearing out, this, uh, the, the nanomaterials can be airborne 
And then of course they can penetrate to all these masks. So this is one of these problems one has to, one has to consider talk, uh, when thinking about using large amounts of nanomaterials. Uh, the nanomaterials used in the construction industry today, they are two groups. One is uh, non-carbon based materials and here comes nanosilica, which has been, if you have been on the ACI Congress, you could see many publications on using nanosilica. Uh, with they really great results, but as you will see later at the end of my lecture, the nanosilica can be also dangerous material, and that I haven't seen one presentation on ACR uh, talking about the possible risk related to nanosilica. There's of course nano clay, nano zinc oxide, nano mineral ferrite. All of them can some have some good properties, but have also problems. When it comes to carbon-based materials, we have of course diamond, graphite, fullerens, amorphous carbon, but the then there is carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers, and these are the most interesting, at least for me. We have done research for many years on those two nanomaterials. So I will try to tell you a little bit more about those. Uh, so carbon nanotubes, it's, it's a, I, I guess now it's a quite common knowledge most people know about this, and they are outstanding. They have very small diameter, four to 30 nanometers. Uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, they even, they even smaller, lens up to several micrometers great electrical conductivity, great strength, and so on. If you add them to, uh, to concrete, they can affect mechanical properties, they can uh, adjust electrical conductivity, but they can also affect other, other physical factors. The, the main problem is the dispersion. And then of course, I'm few status regarding the toxicology. We talk about this at the end more. Then there are carbon nanofibers. These are a little bit bigger. You can see on the on this TM picture that they are like a conical parts which are, which are stuck together. So it's not the one big roll of carbon sheet which is rolled, but it's their conical shape stuck together. So they're a little bit, the carbon nanofibers are weaker, but still have a really good strength and they have good conductivity. They are cheaper and easier to produce. So this can be a big benefit when you think about the uh, uh, mass application of those nanomaterials. Uh, and then examples, uh, how they affect concrete and they can increase the strength, they can increase the flexural strength, compressive flexural strength. They can enhance the capacity, heat capacity. They can densify the microstructure to the uh, controlling the hydration process. Of course, when the hydration process is more intensified then you can lower the permeability and so on. Uh, this is very interesting application about uh, EM, EMI shielding, so electromagnetic interference shielding. Uh, you could use carbon nanofibers in, uh, in this area. There's, Quite a lot of research has been done, so it could be, could be applied. Uh, about, the, about the growth, so how they are growing, it's actually a very interesting process because what you need, you need a crystallist, catalyst particle, uh, and then you have to provide carbon, the right temperature, right amount of carbon, and then uh, you get the growth. So the carbon nanotube will start growing from your catalyst particle. And there are two, two models, there's base growth model and the tip growth model. So when the catalyst particle is actually lifted up and the carbon nanotubes or carbon nanofiber is growing, growing uh, beneath it. Uh, and I, I will, uh, I, the, the reason why I'm telling you about this uh, uh, growth model is to, it will be easier for you to understand how we have developed uh, the methods, method later on, on the, how to grow carbon nanotubes on, on a cement particle. Uh, about carbon nanofibers, quite quite similar approach. There are different types of there. It can be pulsated growth and the smooth growth, and then you get uh, this sort of morphology, quite curvy, and then you get the more straight morphology in this case. So we can, by choosing the the growth mechanism, by choosing the growth parameters, the process parameters, you can you can regulate what kind of nano nanofibers or nanotubes you will you will produce. And of course, the shape, the diameter, this will affect the properties of the find the matrix in which those materials will be incorporated. Uh, the, the method how to produce them is, this is super simplified uh, diagram of a CVD reactor. So in this case, you have a furnace, you have a long pipe, normally a silicon based pipe, and then you have some support with the catalyst. And then you have you run gases inside. There are several variants you can run in. Some gas which has carbon, could be for example, methane, uh, it could be carbon dioxide, it, it really depends. So you provide this right amount of nano, uh, right, right amount of carbon, which flows over your catalyst particles, you provide the right temperature, and then uh, as a result, you will get, uh, you will get this carbon nanofibers growing, carbon nanotubes growing from the catalyst particle. So 
So now, once you know how to grow those materials, you can buy them off the shelf. You can, there are several companies that can provide you whatever amount you need. Uh, but then uh, how to get them to our uh, concrete matrix. So there are two methods. There's the traditional method uh, involving dispersion in water or addition in dry form. This is quite new and uh, it's not my favorite because of health issues. And then there's the new method. And uh, so let's start with this one. The tra in traditional method, you have the, for example, here you see carbon multi-wall multi carbon nanotubes. These are the same nanotubes after functionalization. So the, the reason that the difference you see is the huge agglomeration. What actually you get, you get quite tightly packed particles. And now if you try to mix those with water, of course, you could imagine that there will be a problem with dispersion. So normally use the intensive sonication, you add some surfactants. And if you do it properly, you can uh, wrap those carbon nanotubes into the surfactants and make them make very stable suspension. So if it's done properly, you can really separate them into, into single nano, nanotubes. Uh, the problem is, even if you have this suspension, like this bottle was standing for, for a couple of months and you see there's very little agglomerates visible here in the, at the bottom. So it was perfectly stable. The thing is then the pH of this solution is like, it's pretty much neutral, it's around seven. But the once you add this solution to your concrete and uh, you all know that the concrete has very low pH, what happened is then those perfectly dispersed carbon nanotubes or carbon nanofiber starts to re-agglomerate again. So even though if somebody shows them uh, I, I, I achieved this super stable suspension, it doesn't mean that those carbon nano, nanotubes or nanofibers are well dispersed in your, in your hardened binder matrix. So, uh, so we, it was many, many years ago, we thought what could be the alternative? And uh, we came up with, uh, with the idea, why not to try to synthesize those carbon nanotubes directly on a cement particle using the iron, which is present there as a natural catalyst, this is how we called it. So we created a project application. And this was actually drawing from this project application submitted to Finnish Academy of Science. Uh, this was another one. So our, our dream was to have the cement particles that you put into chemical vapor deposition reactor. You grow this carbon nanofibers on the surface, still having this Portland cement inside, still in a usable form. And then once you mix this thing with the, with the water, you will get the hydrated Portland cement with the carbon nanofibers distributed evenly everywhere. So this was the idea behind the project proposal. Uh, and you know how it is with project proposal, especially if nobody did it before, we didn't know if it's gonna work. And the academy gave us a chance. They paid us lots of money. And uh, this is what we got. So this is a picture of un on the unprocessed cement particle. It's so just standard, which you can see on electron microscope. And this is what we got later. So we got the cement particles with the various amounts of carbon nanofibers, carbon nanotubes growing on the surface of it. This example is, you see there are also empty areas, but in some other, some other cases, it really looked like a Hedgecock. So we managed to do it. And they initially, oh, okay, the other information is then uh, by regulating the synthesis temperature. For example, here, if you have over 600 degrees, you see this carbon nanofibers are much, much uh, having smaller diameter. They are shorter. And there is actually a mix of carbon nanofibers and multiple carbon nanotubes. If you decrease the temperature, you get the higher diameter, bigger diameter carbon nanofibers, less of them. So by changing the process parameters, you can change what kind of morphology of these nanomaterials you have on your cement particles. And of course, this one will affect the properties of your hydrated binder matrix. And this is how it looks once you mix it with water, you have the hydration products, some CSH, and then you have those carbon nanofibers in between. So this is the magnification of this area from here. Otherwise the cross section looks exactly the same. The only difference is that these carbon nanofibers are evenly distributed everywhere throughout your matrix. And, the contrary, and on the contrary to, to, to the solution when you use the water suspension, where those carbon nanofibers are agglomerating, this one provide, ensures that you have really uniform dispersion everywhere. In the other solution, you, would, you could have some agglomerate here, agglomerate here. So instead of improving your mechanical properties, or electrical properties, you would actually worsen them, both of them. Uh, at the beginning, we were also looking at how, what, what, how we could improve the, 
how the properties of the hydrated binder matrix would, uh, would change. And uh, this is the example where you have 100% of this nano-modified cement inside. So this is the reference. You see the electrical resistivity it goes down, way down. Uh, mechanical properties could be improved. You could get almost 50%, uh, 60% improvement. Sometimes you could get lower values. So it all depended what kind of uh, process parameters were used. Like in these cases, when the value went, went, went down, we found out that there was also carbon black uh, being formed. Of course, carbon black is uh, lowering the mechanical properties. So this you could do, but the, the, most, uh, the most important result for us was, was this one. And you could lower the electrical resistivity so much or at the same time, increase the electrical conductivity. So then from this moment on, we thought perhaps the mechanical properties are not, uh, not so important because you can get this increase in much easier ways. You know, we can increase the amount of cement, change the cement type, you can add some silica fume, and you can get it a few times higher, much, but much lower cost and uh, with metals, you know. But uh, affecting the electrical properties, this was the, the big discovery for us. So from, from this, this, this result on, we, we focus really on electrical properties. And then we go to the, to the monitoring. So like I said, sustainability can be one of the ways to improve sustainability is to, to be able to monitor concrete structures from the very beginning. So, so once you get the first, first uh, symptoms of, uh, of internal deterioration, as a, a, so let's say a different way, if you can get those uh, early warning signals very early, very, very early in the process, you can, you can protect your structure from, uh, from deterioration and you can save lots of money, you can uh, increase its sustainability. The common sensors nowadays are like this. So these are normally metallic sensors which are glued on the surface. They are also some, in, some uh, connected to the reinforcement. They are normally not made for the for concrete. They are adopted from other technologies. So the, the problem is then they are, they are not very long lasting. So you can apply them and uh, use them for two or three years, but later on they might be drop off. They might be dropping off. And if you think in the concrete structure should be lasting for one or 200 years in order to improve the sustainability, those monitoring systems are not, not good enough. And uh, for example, in Sweden, between Sweden and Denmark, there's a huge concrete bridge. Uh, built it some years ago, and uh, people were asking actually about our technology, where they could where they could buy it, because those sensors like here, they are just dropping off, and they are not able to have this uh, reliable monitoring in the, in the long run. Uh, so, but uh, the best way would be to to create a concrete which could monitor itself. So, just like our body, our body has this internal sensor; they are built it in. You don't have to plug in some sensor on, your, on the surface of your skin. You just, you just have those sensors in connected to your brain. So uh, the idea is why not to use the same, why not to do the same thing with concrete? Why not to make concrete to send the signal? Uh, then there is something wrong in this, in this area. And uh, most of the sensor is working based on the changes of electrical properties. And uh, of course, everybody knows that concrete is a good, perfectly good insulator. So unless you have water, it doesn't, doesn't this electricity doesn't just go through. So, so how, how to change it, how to get the sense capability. And there has been tests done for years and years, tens of, for, for a few decades now, uh, people are incorporating steel fibers, carbon fibers, carbon black, and, and so on and so on. And you can increase the conductivity, but uh, conductivity itself, itself is not a guarantee you're gonna have a very really good sensing capability. For, for sensing capability, you need, for example, the property which is called the uh, pizza resistic properties. Uh, and then, uh, so how to do it? So in the case of concrete, you can add those conductive phases. And like I said, you can add different, different phases. And if you look at uh, examples, for example, if you add the uh, nano silica film, you lower the electric conductivity too. If you add the titanium dioxide, you, you, you increase it, nano K decrease it and so forth. With the nano, nano alumina ferrite, the results are they vary, sometimes can be increased, sometimes can be decreased. But then when you look at carbon nanofibers and carbon nanotubes, if the dispersion is good enough, if it's uniform enough, then the electrical conductivity is increasing. And also the pizza resistive properties are really, really strong, much stronger in comparison to, to other materials. The, 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 the one, uh, one, uh, one feature which is uh, quite often mis misunderstood is that if you talk, especially to PhD students or to students, and you tell them 
uh, okay, you have this nano material which you can put in, and then you can increase the electrical conductivity. But then they said, okay, so if you add like many, many kilograms of carbon nanotubes, you, you're going to get much better self sensing capability because you make it more and more conductive. So the, the, the truth is, then there is a percolation threshold. You cannot, there is some, some amount of carbon nanofibers, carbon nanotubes, which is the best for inducing this uh, pizza, pizza resistive properties. And the, the amount is actually quite small. If, uh, if you go back to this, our uh, smart SEM, so the semen with the carbon nanofibers on the surface, uh, the, the optimum amount is around six to eight percent, weight percent of the total semen. So, uh, so it's very, very low. You don't need to add a lot of it to get uh, good pizzeristic properties. Uh, just an example. So this is the, the system which we have developed. These are the, the sensors which are which are based on the smart sun uh, with the four cables. This is ready system which you can install in any concrete structure, put to the fresh concrete. And the idea is to to create. This is an example with a bridge. So you can uh, use these sensors and put them in some places which are like the most uh, the most important for the structure. Or you can also cast the area of your of your bridge using this uh, concrete with the smart sum and then use it as a, as a self monitoring uh, structure and then in this case. So the our sensors are looking like this, this is the, the let's say experimental product which we do it's around six centimeters long 12 to 12 in a, in a cross section so it's, it's pretty much like this size quite small. And. Uh, what you can monitor with uh, using those sensors. Well, first of all, you can monitor the strain stress. You can monitor the humidity changes, the temperature changes. You can detect the crack formation. Uh, you can monitor the chloride penetration. And uh, just some examples. For example, here's the compressive stress measurements. And if you look at the reference, so this straight line, so this is pure Portland cement. And you see changes in the, in, the, in the loading doesn't change anything in the resistivity, it's just the same. If you add a small amount of the smart sum, two or 4%, there's almost no change. But, but then when you add uh, eight, eight to 10%, you see the change is really, really huge. So it's like you get 80% change when you apply just 25 megapascal compressive, compressive load. And, the, and the, so now the question would be, so now you've got almost 80% of the capacity change you can measure by just applying this 25 megapascals, but uh, what if uh, you need to have a bigger range? So now the, the morphology of this carbon nanofibers, which are in your, in your sensor, uh, its amount is affecting the sensitivity. So this could be regulated. You could make it, uh, you could cover a much larger range of, uh, of loads, but then of course you will decrease the sensitivity exactly the same way like you, like you do with commercial available metallic sensors. Uh, the humidity measurements, similar situation. If you if you have the reference concrete, you have some change. Uh, so reference just the Portland cement. But when when you add uh, six or eight, eight to ten percent of a smart sum, you see then the change is is really big, and this is covering the range from ten to ninety five percent of relative humidity. And the temperature measurements. This was interesting. We didn't know actually. It's uh, it will be a it will be useful, but uh, what we did, we casted this large beam, and there uh, you can see the smart sense, some smart sense sensor is in the middle of this. And uh, this is the thermocouple reading from the thermocouple. So you see the, the main hydration peak, and the readings from the smart sense sensor are exactly the same. So we don't see this smooth transition here, but we can locate the, the main hydration peak, which is very useful for planning the you know the production process. You can you can use this hydration peak to estimate the, the strain development and the removal of the formal. So now you could see then the same sensor you could you could put here and get the fresh concrete properties, the hydration heat. And then later on the same sensor could be used for for strain sensing or for humidity measurements. Uh, the strain measurements are here. So this uh, normal strain gauge and this our sensor. The same thing after calibration, you could actually cover the, the values. And here you see the sense the, the reference sensor is here, and our uh, smart sum sensor is being it under casted in. So, what are the advantages of, 
of this uh, of this sensor. So one sensor can measure many many parameters. And the, the, the first question comes: So how do you know what you measure? If you can measure everything, and uh, if you need to know the temperature, you need to know the chloride penetration. So the answer is then uh, the location and the orientation of the sensor within the element will will define what's the predominant factor you actually measure. Let's say you put the sensor in the very middle of your, of your concrete element. So of course, the, the heat development will be the most dominating factor. And there won't be any strains, stress and stress, strains and stresses because of loading. So if you want to measure the, the strain, you put it somewhere on the bottom of your beam, where you can predict that the stress is the, the highest. If you, if you want to measure the chloride penetration, the same thing, you put it on the external layers. Uh, and so on and so on. So where you have to, of course, there will be always some effect from the other parameters. It won't be always just the one, just this only one parameter, not only just the temperature, not only just the humidity, it will be always combination, but uh, by, lo by locating the sensor, or orientating the sensor in the right way, you will make it then let's say 80% of the reading is really affected by, the, by this one, one sensor. At the moment, we have, a, we have an upscaling project where we are installing, we'll be installing those sensors in the spring in Sweden in uh, two concrete bridges in parallel to other reference uh, system and we see how it works. So the idea is to calibrate those sensors before installing and then uh, monitoring the system for a couple of years over several seasons of the year and then see how it's how it works uh, with, the, with the parameters. Um, the sensors have high sensitivity and this you can regulate by uh, by the amount and the type of carbon nanomaterials you have on the surface, it's, it's relatively easy to produce. Production of the sensor is nothing else like having a small small mixer, and it's, it actually doesn't differ at all compared to if you make a normal paste sample or mortar sample. The only difference is then you have to replace 20%, 8% or 10% of normal Portland cement with this nano-modified cement. That's the only difference. Otherwise, everything is the same. Use the same plasticizer. You can you can also use secondary cementitious materials. It's like in the next in the next point. So you can let's say you have a structure which has, is using the concrete with a which has a water cement ratio of zero point forty two. There is some uh, five percent of silica fume. There is some poly polycarboxylate based super plasticizer, uh, and so on. So you can you can make the sensor from exactly the same combination like the concrete you will, you, will, you will monitor, with the only exception then the 10% or 8% of the cement has to be replaced with a certain, certain cement. So, so you can see then uh, almost any contractor could make the sensor almost on the building side. Of course, if you want to have exact, exactly the same age of the sensor, you could do it, let's say one day before, or even during casting, the during casting you can because it won't. We have a, we have a technology actually then, uh, it should be possible to cast wet on wet the sensor. So you could uh, cast the sensor, put the sensor in wet form to a casted surface, to the casted new concrete, and then let it hydrate almost with the same speed like the surrounding concrete. The technology is now on a developmental stage, but it will be possible. So, but at the moment you would have to cast the sensor at least one day before. So it hardens, then you can put it in and start measuring from the beginning. But then there's of course the question of, about the uh, about the hydration of the sensor of the portland cement being in the port in the in the sensor itself and we have done some tests so the preferred solution if you want to use those sensors actually to make them at least one month before calibrate them and then put them to the structure but still using the same uh, the same material so but the only thing will be then the sensor will be one month older than the surrounding structure and then uh, this is related to the last point but then when you think about uh, how long the structure should be used. Uh, so years or tens of years, perhaps one or two hundred years. So this one month won't make any any significant difference. And then of course you can uh, the microstructure should be quite the same, which is also important. Looking at the, for example, transport properties, chloride penetration, those things. So you can simulate. And then none of the other sensors which you can buy at the moment is, is providing you this opportunity to, to, to create the same microstructure or very similar microstructure. Um, then there is another another topic. You, if you if you install this uh, smart smart sensors on on your bridge, and uh, let's say the structure is located somewhere in a, in a remote area, you have to provide some uh, some energy to 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 make this uh, system 
to function to collect the data and to send the data. So you can also use the approach used called the energy harvesting. And in, there are several several ways how you can harvest energy. So one is the piezoelectric effect. So when you have a mechanical deformation, you can produce the electricity. Uh, if you have a temperature change, uh, so if you have a temperature is going, let's say, from plus 20 to plus 40 and back, you can produce the electrical current from it. You can have a thermoelectric effect. And in this case, let's say you have an element which has a gradient of temperature. You could imagine, uh, for example, uh, one pillar from the, uh, from the bridge. So the foundation of the pillar is immersed in water, which has normally a much lower temperature, and the upper part is, uh, is exposed to, to sun. So then you have a you can have a 20, 30, even 40 degrees difference constantly between those two parts. And this could be used to, to utilize the thermoelectric effect and produce the electrical current. And there are of course the other methods which are which are very very standard. And the, the thermoelectric energy harvesting is uh, it's based on the Seebeck effect. So you have a potential temperature, the potential difference and the temperature just in a ratio. And the, so normally you don't you don't you cannot get this effect very easily in a concrete uh, concrete uh, elements. Uh, even if you add the carbon nanotubes as a, as a dispersion, it uh, the results were not that great as far as I I know. So there is some some comparison. If you add other type of material, for, for example, ferrite oxide, you can get uh, 2,400 microvolts per, per each degree. But uh, if you ask, for example, steel fibers just get 68 microvolts, so it's very little. If you add carbon fibers, you get only 1.8 to 14 microvolts, so it's very, very low, low numbers. Uh, what about, in case of our data, when you added uh, nanomodified cement, we got 545 microvolts per, per degree, and these are the quite high number, and this was not optimized. It was just, we took uh, our, one of our sensors, uh, which, we, which I showed you before, we, we applied the temperature difference uh, of 20 degrees to both ends, and this, this is the value we have, we have got. So it was a good, good starting point. So this is how we, uh, how we did it. Then later, actually, we, so the initial tests were made with our sensors, but later we made samples which are 10, 10 centimeters long, and we created this graph so you can see, even at uh, just a few degrees, you already get a quite reasonable number. And then it goes almost uh, in a linear matter up with, uh, with the increasing temperature. So like I said, this could be used, this is just one example which I mentioned. So you could apply this, uh, uh, this smart SAM to this area. So one is immersed in the water, and one's in the, on the outside exposed to sun. And then in Sweden, of course, you might have an ice. So the temperature of the water is very, very low. Upper one can, can get a higher temperature and you could actually apply some extra dark colors, for example to accelerate the heating process. And uh, this should be enough to a this part sheet to provide energy for the, for the monitoring systems. Uh, then there is a topic I have seen uh, here. You have, uh, you have specialists working on, uh, on the self-healing processes. And, uh, most of you probably know that there are those two types of self-healing process for concrete, autonomous self-healing and autogenous self-healing. This is really cool because you put bacteria, you put some extra capsules, with some healing agents and when the crack goes through, breaks the capsules and heals the crack. Uh, there has been uh, tons of research done on this one and some of them is very advanced. So, but we, we went the other way, we went for the more traditional way. So we tried to see how to, how to induce the formation of certain phases, for example, CSH, carbon, carbon, calcium carbonate or even portlandite in the crack. And then normally we also use some PVA fibers because they show them they uh, they, they support the self-healing. So what I wanted to show you also, we, we try to find a method how to, how you could use external curing to induce the self-healing. So for example, let's say you, you go to the structure and you see cracks, and then instead of injecting them with resin, which is normally done, especially the small cracks are quite easy to heal with the, with the resin. Uh, you could just spray some, let's say magic liquid on the surface, saturate the crack, fill it in with this liquid and uh, hopefully it will heal. So we, we had uh, several, there are several solutions we are testing. And the one of them was also using the multi-wall carbon nanotubes. So that was uh, multi-wall carbon nanotubes, multi-wall multi carbon nanotubes, certain surfactants in it. 
and to just the water. And uh, what we did was to, to keep spraying this, uh, this substance a couple of times in a week. And uh, we have got this. It was, it was uh, I think you remember after one or two weeks, we got this full, full healing of this crack. Mostly it was filled with uh, calcium carbonate and the Portlandite. And of course, doesn't give the, doesn't recover the full load being capacity. It's not really mechanical strengthening, but it prevents the penetration of aggressive liquids. And you know, mostly when you have crack formation of a reinforced, in the reinforced concrete. So that the big risk is then the aggressive media, what uh, with chlorides can just penetrate through the cracks, get to the reinforcement and initiate its, uh, its, uh, its corrosion. And then, you know, the rest of the process, it just goes really fast and the structure has to be either renovated or demolished. So, so by applying this simple, uh, simple solution of multi-wall carbon nanotubes, with some surfactants, you could, you could ignite this self-healing process and, and make it really efficient. So this is just one example of, of these results we have got using the nanomaterials as well. So in this case, sustainability can be enhanced by uh, healing the cracks. Uh, then the effects on mechanical properties. This is what I mentioned at the beginning. When you, when you look at the, at the literature preview starting in uh, 2008, I think, you will see that many was, were trying to use carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofiber, single wall, multi wall, whatever it was, to increase the mechanical properties. And of course, you can do it. There is some, uh, some certain critical incorporation or con concentration of these carbon nanotubes. So you get the uh, pore filling, you get the bridging effect between the cracks, you stiffer the CSH. But if you add too many of these carbon nanotubes, they actually get the opposite effect. You get the agglomerates, uh, you get more air voids, and at the end of the day, you, you lower the compressive strength and, and other mechanical properties. And if you look at the literature, this is just a small, small uh, shot of the, of the table I have done using, and you see that the scatter is tremendous. You can have, a, you can have, for example, here, you can have a 19% increase of the compressive strength, but on the other hand, you can have 80% decrease of the compressive strength. So there are so many factors that affect this. And I think one of the most predominating one is really the agglomeration. And uh, like I showed at the beginning, this was one of the reasons why we thought that uh, growing these carbon nanotubes on the cement particles solved these problems. But this uh, effect on the mechanical properties, it's, I know some researchers still do research on this, but uh, I personally believe that they are easier way easier ways to, to get much better result instead of putting this carbon nano, nano, nanomaterials inside to get the highest strength. Um, then there, there's a first, of course, the durability. The more durable the structure is, the more sustainable it is. So the idea is to make it so it shouldn't deteriorate through the entire lifespan of, of the structure. And the, if you look at the, how nanomaterials affected the durability, uh, it's good and it's bad. So assuming then the dispersion was done in a proper way, uh, so there are no agglomerates and basically you've got the better mechanical properties, you normally have reduced capillary absorption, there's reduced water absorption, the permeab gas permeability is also lowered, there's lower carbonation. Everything comes from the fact that uh, your microstructure is much denser and it's just to the supporting of hydration processes. Uh, the load beam capacity, seem to be increased when you expose it to higher temperature when you have carbon nanotubes. Then there are some uh, questionable results about the alkali silica reaction. So it seems to be a, a distorting should be limited, but it was not really shown as far as I know. But then there were problems with the frost resistance. There were both types of results, so improved properties and uh, worsened properties. Uh, the corrosion was the same, so I was saying then uh, the was increased, others were showing that it was, it was improved, and so on and so on. So, so general comment is then uh, there is no general trend. You cannot say if you use nanomaterials, you will improve the durability. One has to look at each separate case and see what what's the final result will be. Now comes the fun part, the risks. So the topic, which is not very widely discussed, I would say. Uh, and this is about all nano all nanomaterials. So first of all, the nanoparticles have very large specific surface area. So it means they have uh, exceptionally large number of atoms or molecules on their surface. So uh, their bi biological reactiveness and chemical reactiveness is tremendously increased. And why it's so important? Because 
it means then that if such nanoparticles, nanoparticle gets into your body, it will be much more active with all the uh, all the cells you have in your body. Uh, then it wouldn't it wouldn't if it would be much just just bigger one. Uh, and this is what I said also at the beginning. You might have a substance or the material which is uh, pretty much inert when it comes to toxicological behavior in the, when once in a human body. But once you once you make it smaller, for example, through mechanochemical activation or very very intensive grinding, you can actually induce the toxic strong hazardous behavior of those materials. And we have done some tests uh, on, for example. Uh, Mechanochemically activating uh, tailings, uh, and then you could you could increase the release of uh, harmful elements from it just because of grinding. So one has to be really really careful uh, what's happening after after the material is is, is uh, turned into a nanoparticle size powder. Uh, in general, one could say that all types of nanoparticles are, should be considered potentially hazardous. And uh, how they can get into your body, of course, it's via inhalation, absorption, or ingestion. Uh, one of the one of the common questions, like if you if you look how the everybody knows the story of asbestos fibers, they're also a great uh, great discovery, and uh, and they they improved the compressive strength. They were, it was used all over the world. The asbestos, not only for structural elements or construction materials, but also in a car elements and uh, for breaking parts, for example. And uh, everything stopped once they found out and uh, people started to get cancer, lung cancer because of asbestos. And if uh, any of you would look at the scanning electron microscope on uh, asbestos fibers and the uh, carbon nanotubes, or carbon nanofibers, you would see that they look quite similar and they're sort of scary. So there was a question whether they could be as dangerous as asbestos. So since I started research on carbon nanotubes or nanofibers in uh, 2008, I was looking at this following all this, uh, not all, but uh, quite a lot of papers. And I have to tell, I have to say that until today, nobody said definitively that it's, it's harmful or that it's not harmful. So the question is still open. There is much more data, but still it's, uh, there's still a question mark by it. So in here, I just, uh, I will just show you a couple of, couple of uh, most important points. What I have what I have found in the uh, in the research results. So it seems then that when the fiber is very long and straight, it's generally more more hazardous. If the fiber is like shorter and it's like uh, has this uh, curvy shape, it can be encapsulated uh, and it can be actually dis disposed by your body outside without staying inside and causing all the all the trouble. So. Uh, so this one thing, if you have a long straight fibers, nanotubes, multi-wall carbon nanotubes, single, single wall carbon nanotubes, or the carbon nanofibers, carbon nanofibers, there could be a risk, then they could be harmful. So this longer, shorter one and the very curvy uh, are easier to, to be removed by the, by, by, by the human body. Uh, then there's also interesting thing about the enzyme. This, the first results I had seen, they were at least 10 years ago. I know they were coming from Sweden. They were saying they were suggesting that some the human body has some enzymes which could actually uh, destroy the, the carbon nanofibers or carbon nanotubes inside of the body. And then many tests were, were, have been done, uh, and it, it actually confirmed it. So, for example, here you see after after just as eight days, most of these carbon nanotubes were were completely destroyed and could be just disposed. But the, the, there were differences depending on what kind of carbon nano material it was. For example, uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, there was no decomposition observed. When it comes to multi wall carbon nanotubes, there, there was a decomposition. So one has to look precisely what material you have. Um, so if I would like to like summarize this uh, going material by material. So when it comes to multi wall carbon nanotubes, Generally, the results are very contradicting, but uh, longer carbon nanotubes, multi wall carbon nanotubes over one and a half micrometer showed the similar risk or greater risk in comparison with asbestos fibers to cause, to cause inflammation and fibrosis of, in lungs. Uh, but then the shorter ones, there, was no, uh, there were no uh, signs of uh, causing inflammatory response. 
Uh, the, the one worrying thing is uh, actually in all of those materials you later is the possible damage in DNA. So to get this material in, in, in your body, who knows how your kids are, really? Uh, and then this is interesting. So uh, there has been a, there has been a, uh, the theory saying then that if carbon nanotubes are functionalized, which means they have better bond to the matrix, uh, they should be released in a small amounts once you make, for example, the demolition process. And and uh, the guys from Australia they did some tests and uh, it was confirmed. So when you have this functionalized carbon nanomaterials, they stay better together with the cement when you demolish your building so they are not airborne okay, so this is a good thing but on the other hand the functionalization normally means that they are more active and uh, they can interact better with your body so it's good and it's bad to have this have them functionalized uh, generally the single world carbon nanotubes those single world carbon nanotubes they are not so commonly used in a, in a concrete technology because of their price and uh, difficulty to handling. But uh, the bad thing about them is then that they are, they are used in electronics. So be careful when you, when you try to break up your battery and there will be single carbon nanotubes. So they are way, way more toxic compared to the multi wall carbon nanotubes. And then here, surface functionalized CNT showed even stronger toxicity. So the functionalization, small size, and being straight, these are like the three things which, which increase the toxicology of those. Of those materials. Um, and also here possible damage to the to the DNA. They, 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 I didn't find anything uh, documented relocation from lungs to other organs. So they didn't find those single carbon nanotubes coming out of your lungs to, to liver or somewhere else. At least until when I was writing the when I was writing the book. Uh, then it comes carbon nanofibers. This, this is my favorite because seems then uh, looking at the carbon nanofibers, they seem to be the most safe of all the three materials. So the multi wall carbon nanotubes and single wall carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes are more hazardous, potentially more hazardous to humans than carbon nanofibers. And uh, this is actually one of the reasons, one of the few reasons why, why we focus our research on this carbon nanofibers. They're also cheaper, they're easier to produce. And they are not this much weaker than the multi wall carbon nanofiber nanotubes. And uh, if anyway, if you look at the application we have, for example, to, to increase the piezoelectric properties, then uh, it doesn't really matter this, uh, this difference between the multi wall carbon nanotubes and the CNFs. But when it comes to uh, health, health issues, these are way safer materials to, to be handled. And then when you look at the other nanomaterials, and this is actually interesting because. Like I said, on this last ACI, there were a couple of papers about uh, all these great effects of uh, nano silica, uh, but they can be potentially hazardous. So this is what the medical studies show. Titanium dioxide, which is also commonly used, for example, self-healing facade, probably is not hazardous. Nanoclay is probably not, it's organic material. But uh, when you look at the nano alumina, nano ferrite, they are in red. And the nano alumina is actually seem to be more hazardous than the CNTs and CNFs together. Nano thing is questionable. Uh, other other carbon other um, carbon based materials, carbon black can be graphite can be graphene can be as well. So the new material it's not the, it's not a fiber they are plates as you know but still can be hazardous. Uh, carbon nanoboots also can be hazardous, but the uh, the generally, one has to always look at the amount, you know, how much of this material you have. If they are very small amounts, even the single wall carbon nanotubes won't make any harm to our body. But if you think about uh, somebody who is exposed continuously or for a long time to, to single wall carbon nanotubes, he can die from it eventually. So one has to be very careful. And then when you think about the size, this is what I mentioned at the beginning when I showed this, uh, the size comparison. Remember the, the uh, virus, also, COVID molecule, COVID, uh, COVID is just like diameter of, uh, let's say, one micrometer. And then carbon nano, nanotubes, nano, nanofibers, they have around 10, 20 nanometers. So, so we, have a, we have a problem to, to isolate our set from COVID using those masks, how it is with these nanomaterials. And this is a really big issue. If, you, if one has to work with uh, carbon or nanomaterials, one has to have special, special masks, which can catch those, those tiny. Uh, tiny, tiny particles, and uh, normally they are. You can buy those, but uh, you cannot just use this normal 
dust mask to, to protect yourself against the material. So this is also important for the mulching processes, working in the laboratory or even working at the mixing plant. Um, some small summary. Um, so uh, of course, concrete everybody knows it's uh, it's better. It's it's the most used material after water on earth and has a very long history. And and I, I would say that nano technology is just one one extra step to develop concrete, and we can make it greener if you you know how to use those nano materials. And um, and there are some uh, some other advantages. And uh, as you can see, I put everywhere possibly, 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 possibly. The thing is. It really depends how these nanomaterials are uh, introduced into the concrete, how it's handled, what kind of materials you have. So you can have anything from uh, better mechanical properties to, to worse mechanical properties. So all depends, but possibly you could, you could enhance everything. And the negative, this I was, I was just talking about. So one has to be careful just because of the small size of those. Uh, of course, there is uh, the high price is still an issue. The manual materials got way cheaper uh, in the last in the last couple of years, but they are still quite expensive. And the many of these nano materials are still in experimental stage, so one has to keep this in mind because uh, the long term effects of those materials on humans and as well on uh, on the concrete properties are not very well studied yet. Uh, yeah, and that's it. So if somebody is uh, someone is interested in a Get to know more about carbon nanotubes. There's this nice book which was published last year. There are a couple of papers. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me via email. Thank you.